Today we are talking about one of the mega secrets of the rich and very wealthy, and that is borrowing against scarce assets. More specifically in this video, I'm gonna be talking about the scarcest asset of them all. That's right, Bitcoin. Welcome back everyone to another video. My name is Ian Major, I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin club, and all around raging capitalist. And so in today's video, we're gonna break down the overview of this concept and idea. We're gonna talk about both the pros and the cons, right? There's two sides to every coin. Uh, we're gonna talk about the mechanics of how this actually works and some of the providers out in the marketplace um, that sort of offer this type of service and some of the different things to watch out for uh, along the way. So this should be a really exciting one. It's one I've been meaning to do for quite some time. Um, and we'll also talk about the motivation behind why one would want to do this in the first place. So buckle up, it should be an exciting ride. For those returning to the channel, welcome back my friends. As always, it is great to have you. And for those new to the channel, and I know there are many of you, uh, 80 plus percent of you uh, currently watching are not subscribed. And so if you like this content, I invite you to subscribe and come join us on our merry uh, gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of things Bitcoin related, whether it's wallets, tutorials, technology, updates, news, the latest and greatest um, developments. And so you won't want to miss a thing. With all that out of the way, though, let's go ahead and jump into an overview of this idea. All right, so let's motivate this discussion a bit and talk about the problem that this is solving for. In our current era of pre-hyper-Bitcoinization, there may still be times when you need fiat, right? This could be to cover unexpected um, expenses, medical emergencies, etc. cetera. Uh, this could be to, um, for just general kind of life expenses, um, et cetera, et cetera. There could be a lot of different reasons for this. And so, you know, one of those ways you might raise fiat is to sell your Bitcoin. Um, this is the worst thing you could do, right? Because not only are you probably going to buy those sats back uh, at a higher price later on, um, but, you know, unless you're using a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and I've done videos on these, you will probably face some tax implications in the form of capital gains as well. Um, and so that's, that's horrible. Um, and so the one way around that is to instead borrow against your Bitcoin. So think of how, uh, you know, kind of a home equity line of credit um, operates in a similar fashion. You're raising fiat, you're taking in fiat proceeds uh, as part of a loan, um, and you're posting, in that case, your sort of home as the underlying collateral. Um, and so the pros of this approach are obviously that you don't have to sell your Bitcoin, um, and face potential tax implications of doing so. That's great. Furthermore, if you're using the fiat proceeds for business or investment purposes, this could be uh, helping get your startup off the ground. This could be, um, you know, uh, going into growing your business. Uh, this could be, you know, going to buy a rental property. Like, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you can write those interest expenses off on your taxes as well. Very, very cool. Um, and lastly, another you know benefit of this approach is that there's no kind of credit checks uh, required. In the fiat world, you know, credit worthiness is really the name of the game. And so uh, a bank will look at you and assess your credit worthiness and ability to repay. Uh, and sort of that's Hopefully, you know, the agencies that track all your information will say, yeah, this individual is credit worthy. Whereas in this world, your mere owning of Bitcoin makes you a, a worthy borrower. Let's now talk about the cons or the potential risks of this approach because they are significant and, and worth consideration. One is the risk of losing your Bitcoin collateral. So this would be a situation in which maybe the price of uh, Bitcoin absolutely collapses, some black swan event, uh, similar to what we saw in March of 2020. And so as we'll discuss in the mechanics section next, um, if that price or if that exchange rate rather of Bitcoin goes below a certain threshold, your collateral will be liquidated, meaning that the um, entity you're doing this through will sell your collateral on the market in order to raise funds to pay back the debt that you owe. So that's not good. 
The second key risk is really, you know, really revolves around general counterparty risk. Uh, the whole not your keys, not your coins mantra that you've heard myself and many others say millions of times. And so if you're just straight up depositing this collateral with a third party, um, right, not your keys, not your coins. And so we'll talk about some of the different options later on where there, there is at least some variety in terms of um, uh, there's some multi-signature setups where you can at least still hold a key to your funds. Uh, but there's many others which are just outright like, hey, you've deposited that. And if something happens to them, if they go, you know, if they go bust or whatever, you're at risk of losing your Bitcoin too. So keep those risks in mind. But let's now with that understanding and those uh, pros and cons, talk about how this actually works. Because as I alluded to in the intro, this really is one of the secret methods of the very wealthy. And this has been the case for hundreds of years. Um, you know, aristocrats that own extremely, um, you know, lucrative and desirable property, for example, in say Manhattan, um, you know, going, going all the way back. I mean, they've, they've, they're able to just sort of roll this over into perpetuity um, because fiat is programmed to debase versus scarce assets. Those scarce assets in fiat terms are going up in value fairly consistently. That's not to say they can't go down as we saw in the 08, um, you know, housing crisis. Uh, but that is the general idea. So let's now talk about the mechanics of how this actually works along with an example. All right, so mechanically how this works is pretty simple. Um, we'll talk about some of the different providers in the next section, but essentially you'll go in, you'll make an account, um, you'll do you know, a quick little onboarding, uh, and then you know, specify the parameters that you, um, that you want, right? Uh, it's going to a couple key sort of things to think about. Um, there's a key concept of loan to value ratio. That is to say, you know, if you have um, fifty thousand uh, dollars worth of Bitcoin, uh, what percent of that value can you actually take out as a loan? Um, and to you know adjust for the fact that we still see quite a lot of volatility uh, in the market. That that ratio is is typically quite small. You know, maybe twenty five percent up to fifty percent or so, um, depending on um, you know depending on the other parameters in that agreement. And so you might say, okay, you know, I'm willing to um, you know I'm willing to put down this much uh, Bitcoin, um, and I will then take out you know X percent of that as a loan, right? Uh, the entity will draw up some loan agreements. You'll sign it. And then they'll provide you with an address to send the Bitcoin to. And then within, you know, probably a couple days after that, uh, fiat will be deposited into your bank account. Um, or, to, you know, there's there's other ways to, to sort of um, do that. But like that's structurally what's happening. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Again, key concept of loan to value ratio, uh, which again is typically going to range between 25 to 50 percent at this stage. And as we discussed, you know, there is this risk of market fluctuation as well. Let's say that, you know, you, uh, the requirement for the loan to value is 50%. And let's say you put down 50,000 worth in Bitcoin. That means you can um, raise 25,000 in fiat proceeds. Let's say that the price of Bitcoin goes, um, you know, goes down. What will happen is that that loan to value ratio uh, will increase, right? The amount of loan, that 25% uh, or that 25,000 uh, rather as a percent of what is now the updated value of my collateral uh, is a higher percentage. And so what that may mean is that you may have to add more Bitcoin to preserve that loan to value ratio requirement. So there is a sort of need to kind of be thoughtful about this, moderate, you know, don't just kind of do this and walk away. Um, but depending on the platform you use, you know, there should be, you know, things like alerts and, and, uh, things like that. Um, by the way, the other big sort of lever in this is of course the interest rate, you know, you're, you're taking out a loan and so you're going to pay interest on that loan. And, um, if you do a lower loan to value ratio, let's say only 25%, um, you will be able to 
typically get away with paying uh, a smaller amount on interest because that is a less risky loan for the entity that you're doing this through. So those are some of the key parameters. Um, we'll talk about in the next section as well, like there's typically going to be an originate a loan origination fee. Maybe that's a percent of what you're, you know, of what you're borrowing. Um, there can also be uh, prepayment penalties. So paying back the loan early may have fees associated with it. I mean, go figure. And so these are some of the important parameters to investigate. I'll talk about a more thorough deep dive of this in the next section. Uh, but let's now actually go through a numerical example of how this could actually look in practice. And I've taken this uh, inspiration from a great video that Mark Moss did, um, which I will link in the description down below if you're curious to check it out. Um, but I've modified his example here. And so what this is showing is a little uh, sort of example worksheet of how this may work in practice. Uh, keep in mind, these are, you know, these are assumptions. This could change wildly. Uh, you know, um, nothing is rocket science here, but keep in mind that there are assumptions embedded. So what this is showing is, you know, sort of next 10 years, let's say, and let's say that you start currently with a, um, a dollar value of $100,000 in Bitcoin uh, that, you, that you currently have. Um, that's column B. Um, and column C is a projection of how that exchange rate uh, will change going forward. Now, keep in mind that on average, the compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin uh, over the last decade has been 200% on average, which is absolutely insane. Um, now, you know, one may say, well, that's surely not going to be the, uh, the rate that we see continued going further, uh, which is probably true. Uh, it, it's eventually going to be true when that exactly happens is anyone's guess. But, you know, what I've done here is I've used Mark's kind of uh, hypothetical numbers. And so maybe we continue growing at a very fast rate for, you know, the next five years. And then, you know, maybe that tapers off as more and more capital is sucked into the black hole that is Bitcoin. Um, and so you could modify these numbers as, you know, however you see fit. Uh, but suffice it to say, that is what then gets you um, the increasing value of your Bitcoin stack in column B. Column D is just the associated dollar gain from year to year. Now, let's say, for example, that you take a 25% loan to value uh, out on your Bitcoin. So in year one, 25% of the 100K in value would give you the ability to raise $25,000 in fiat. Uh, let's assume that there is some origin, you know, there, there's obviously interest, some origination. Uh, I've assumed that this is about 6%. Again, that could change, um, you know, in a big way, depending on, on some of these parameters. But let's just go with that assumption. And so that's, that's sort of what happens. You know, you need to pay that 1500 and then you have this 25000 in debt that needs to, of course, be repaid as well. Let's look at what happens in the next year. In the next year, my Bitcoin um, has gone up in value in fiat terms from 100 to 300. And so 25% of that is 75,000 that I could take out, right? And that 75,000 allows me to pay back the 25,000, um, you know, of course, plus the interest. And so this free cash flow column in column H is the 75,000 minus the 25,000 that you're paying back uh, minus the 1,500 just for keeping it all, uh, keeping all the math within this spreadsheet. And so this means that you have now generated in year two free cash flow of about $49,000 uh, and so on and so forth. You can see how these numbers change as we go forward in time and as the value of that collateral uh, grows and grows and grows. And so that's the whole concept, your ability to kind of roll the debt over with an underlying asset that is appreciating rapidly in price. Now, like I said, there's a lot of assumptions built into that example. Um, the sort of ending value of 
uh, of the Bitcoin in year 10 in this example assumes a very, very large market cap, right? Over a hundred trillion uh, at that stage. And who knows like how rapidly or, or if we will you know, get there. Uh, my bet is certainly it's a when and not if type of question. Is it within the next 10 years? Uh, it remains to be seen. But the point is you could see that through rolling your debt over with this highly valuable, scarce, appreciating asset that is Bitcoin, uh, you could potentially live off of your stack um, by generating free cash flow and using some of the loan proceeds from subsequent years to pay back the loans in prior years. With that example that hopefully helps illustrate how this actually works, let's now talk practically about some of the different providers in the marketplace uh, and some of the pros and cons of each of them. All right, in this section, I want to just wrap up with talking about high level, some of the different types of options that are out there uh, for how you could uh, execute on this. And so I first want to talk about some of the different parameters that are crucial to look out for and think about as part of this decision. The first is the whether it's a custodial provider or not. And so there's a whole spectrum here. There's a lot of well-known uh, custodial providers um, BlockFi, Celsius, Nexo, etc. Um, they're sort of hybrids like Unchained Capital, uh, which has a multi-signature setup, meaning you keep one of the keys associated with your funds. And so it's not the case that you know Unchained Capital could just kind of unilaterally do something with your uh, with your funds. Uh, there's also Lend by Hodl Hodl, which is a peer-to-peer. Uh, lending platform for um, for Bitcoin, which is very nice. Um, so that's one critical fact. I would I would say, uh, ideally, something like Unchained Capital is is more ideal than say, uh, BlockFi. BlockFi, by the way, I would just not recommend at all. Full stop. I mean, the, the amount of shady stuff they've done, the amount of rehypothecation, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, it's it's just it's just not worth it, um, and so you know I think I think there are good options like Celsius and Nexo uh, in the more custodial realm. Um, Unchained Capital would be a very good option in the sort of middle-ish realm, if you will, uh, and then maybe something like Lend by Hodl Hodl uh, on the you know non-custodial realm. Um, keep in mind, there's also tr- more traditional. Uh, financial institutions, as an example, in the U.S., Fidelity Investments, um, you know, provides loans backed by Bitcoin, uh, and there are others as well. So that's one dimension. Um, as part of that, you know, there's a reputational element, um, and so again, something like BlockFi has just had way too much, uh, way too much kind of sketchiness associated around it, and so you really want to like look at the communities surrounding these different entities um, and, and take that into consideration. It really is important, especially in these early days uh, of where we are. Um, of course, practical consideration is like the rates, like what rates could you get? I would say they're generally pretty competitive across platforms. Um, you know, you probably will see a range of, you know, anywhere between like five, six, seven, eight percent Um, maybe up to something significantly higher if you're trying to take a really aggressive loan to value ratio and potentially something quite lower if you're taking a very modest loan to value ratio. I think as of this video making, you could get a interest rate as low as like 1% on Celsius if you are, um, you know, if you're doing a 25% loan to value ratio as an example. So those are uh, counterbalancing levers that, um, that go hand in hand. Uh, you're also going to just generally see some different restrictions or requirements for loan to value. There's going to be some platforms that will uh, allow more aggressive and others that are just like, here is the cap. Um, and sort of that is what it is. Um, there's also, as I mentioned earlier, origination fees. And so check that out. Those should also be very competitive. Maybe it's like a percent of the loan uh, value that you're taking out. Um, but you know, do factor that in. It, it can make a difference term options for loans, right? So what's the length of the loan, um, you know, repayment period. And then importantly, as I was mentioning earlier, are there any penalties associated with uh, prepayment of the loan? 
that's something really important to consider, especially depending on you know that Excel we were looking at and how you'd want to roll over your debt and repay prior years as you do that. The last thing I would say, and this maybe gets a little bit into the reputational piece, is this idea of rehypothecation. Um, and so this is basically, I'll throw a diagram up. This is essentially when you post that collateral and the entity you've posted that collateral with turns around and lends that out again to make an additional yield or spread uh, on that collateral. And so it's this kind of pyramid-like you know, uh, string where collateral that you have posted is, is being taken by that entity and lend it out again. And oh, by the way, like that could happen multiple more times. You know, maybe they've lent your collateral out to a hedge fund and the hedge fund then lends that collateral out. And so it's, it's wild, but you know, this is a thing, um, at least in the US. I'm not as, uh, as familiar with practices internationally, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're all the same. And so those are kind of the key parameters I would encourage you to think about critically and look at. Um, again, just from my kind of uh, not necessarily personal experience, I want to be very clear. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't outright go and say like you got to go do this with any of these providers. Um, but you know, I think something like Celsius is a is a good option in the custodial realm. Uh, Unchained Capital, I think, is probably the sweet spot for everything. Um, I really like their multi-sig kind of setup. I really like their philosophy. They don't do rehypothecation. Um, you know, they're uh, as far as I, I believe they're Bitcoin only. Um, and so that's right. That's probably my pick. I'm going to do a more in-depth video on Unchained Capital here in a little bit. And so do stay tuned for that. Again, if you're not subscribed, I'd encourage you to do so uh, so you can stay up to date on all these great tools and platforms to give you more optionality, right? That is part of what this is all about. Um, with all of that covered, let's go ahead now and conclude the video. All right, so there you have it, my friends. Um, we covered a lot of ground as always. Just as a quick recap, we talked first about the motivation for this. Um, part of financial sovereignty is optionality, the ability to kind of control your destiny uh, and I think being able to raise fiat funds against your Bitcoin collateral is a good option to at least be aware of that it exists and sort of how to do it if the if if you know there's a requirement to do so. Um, as we talked about, there's a lot of really great benefits of this. I mean, you could potentially roll this over into perpetuity and you know live off your Bitcoin forever. Um, there are also obvious risks to this as well that we discussed. There's counterparty risk, uh, depending on the you know setup uh, and entity that you're using to do this through. Uh, there's the risk of being liquidated, both and both of those risks uh, risk losing your Bitcoin. And so I would never, ever, ever, ever recommend doing this with um, you know a portion of your stack that you would just be like unable to bear losing, right? Um, but, you know, I, I do think there are many use cases for why this could be very beneficial for folks, um, especially if we continue to see fiat programmatically debase versus the ultimate pristine asset that is Bitcoin. Um, but for now, we'll go ahead and leave this video here. I hope you found this useful and valuable. Uh, if you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like. Comment down below with your thoughts, questions, um, which of these options or platforms would you like to see covered in future videos? I really do take that into account as I make the schedule uh, for the channel. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As always, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then.